Well, good evening, friends, and happy Ash Wednesday. I know that it's been a whirlwind of a week, so thank you for joining us here for our Ash Wednesday worship. Tonight's scripture reading is going to come from the letter to the Romans, chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, friends, it has been one heck of a week. I know that if you are in Texas or anywhere near this winter storm, that you have probably had to endure things this week that were brand new or that you maybe have not experienced in a long time. For those of you who maybe used to live up north, it has been just insane. Uh, luckily, we've got power right now and we're doing okay. Our family is uh, doing okay and making it through. We're keeping those kiddos entertained. Um, that's most of what uh, this has just been, just trying to keep the kids entertained and <laughs> doing the dishes while the power comes back on. We've had water sort of intermittently. Uh, luckily, I was able to cobble together a bath in the in the uh, sink so that I didn't look like a homeless ghost for the video here. <laughs> but it is, uh, it is good to be with you here tonight. Thank you for tuning in and joining us in worship. Friends, this is a weird Ash Wednesday. But as we've gone through this week, I've noticed one thing that I see quite often during a crisis is that I've seen the best in humanity. I've just seen some of the best in human beings this week. We've seen love and support poured out on Facebook. Everybody sort of has this we're all in this together feeling and it's been really fantastic to see that communal nature of humanity when it comes out in times like this. I mean, even on like the Nextdoor app, I don't know if you've ever been to Nextdoor, that app is usually uh, one of the darker places of the internet. It's just neighbors complaining constantly. I mean, that's, that's pretty much it. But even on there, it was encouragement and people updating about, you know, I have water, I don't have power, sort of helping each other to, to be in this together. And so it's been beautiful to see this. It's, it's almost as if we all agree to be kind human beings when a crisis hits. We all remember that we're all humans, we're all in this together, and we just kind of agree to all be kind. Uh, we, we hit pause on our arguments and our polarizations, you know, we hit pause on our prejudices and the fights that we're having, you know, for a day or two. Because we know it's not going to last. We know that we just kind of have this brief moment where everybody is, is calm and peaceful, but things are not going to stay this way forever. And during this week, I saw this great tweet from a pastor friend of mine named Josh Fitzpatrick, and he wrote this. Texans, over the past few days, I've witnessed the best of humanity and so many people caring for each other. Can't we agree to wait a few days before switching back to the worst of humanity mode again? It's trying to steal its spotlight back, and I'm okay if we don't let it. And the more that I've been thinking about Josh's words, I've been thinking that that is so true, that we have this moment where we are kind and compassionate to one another, but it's not going to be long before we see the worst in us come back. And I've even started to see it already this week. Just like clockwork, the worst in humanity comes raging back. Just after a couple of days of this, I don't know if you've noticed, but suddenly everybody is an expert on power grids. I don't know about you, but I never thought about power grids before this week, and suddenly everyone I know on Facebook is an expert. They all have an opinion, they all know who to blame, who to fire, and how to fix it. And it's just funny how instantly everyone's an expert on this, because we're all looking for someone to blame, right? When things happen like this, this can't be our fault, so we need someone to blame. And when we go online, we see politicians are blaming power grids, and power grids are blaming politicians, and politicians are blaming other politicians. Everyone's looking for someone to blame. And we jump right in. We join right in with that because we can't be to blame, right? I mean, th this can't be our fault. And yet the more I've reflected this week, I've had a lot of time to reflect sitting in the dark and the cold, uh, I realized one thing for sure is that I was unprepared for this. I mean, we have like one flashlight in our house. I had no idea where it was. We have one candle left over from Christmas, so our, our home has smelled like Christmas all week because it's the one candle we have uh, to keep the lights on whenever it's dark. And I was just wildly unprepared for this disaster. And when my unpreparedness, when, when the chaos hit, my unpreparedness turned into crisis. And in that crisis, I was sent looking for someone to blame. I was unprepared. And the chaos hit, and that became a crisis, and I went looking for someone to blame. I got to the grocery store, and it's someone's fault that they don't have what I need. There's all these people in front of me. Why don't they deal with this better? Why can't the power company, electric company get this? I just, I want someone to blame. 
Now, I can rectify my physical unpreparedness, right? I mean, believe me, I've got one heck of an Amazon list going. I'm going to get lanterns and matches and candles and blankets and all kinds of stuff so that if this ever happens again or when the power goes out in the future, by God, we will be prepared in the Williams house. But Amazon can't fix the part of me that was looking for someone to blame. Amazon can't fix the fact that we can only stand to be kind to one another for about two days. I mean, even during a crisis. I've watched the tone on social media change from this, we're all in this together, we can do it, to calling names, calling blame, looking for someone, exhorting our anger, and trying to find someone to blame and heap all of this upon. And we see that worst in humanity come out after just a couple of days. Many of us are spiritually unprepared for crisis. And it showed this week. Fortunately, today's Ash Wednesday, and though it's a weird Ash Wednesday, it is Ash Wednesday, and it's the beginning of the season of Lent. Our text today comes from Romans, and it, it said, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. And often I think, what does that mean? What does it mean to conform to this world? I think conforming to this world looks like blaming others during a crisis, trying to find a scapegoat, trying to find someone whose fault it is. I'm uncomfortable. I'm sad. Uh, something is, is, is wrong in my life, so who can I blame? Who can I be mad at? I think that's conforming to the world. That's what Paul cautions us against. I think conforming to this world looks like going through all this, experiencing the loss of material needs, understanding maybe for the first time what it's like to not have reliable power and heat and water. And then when all of this comes back tomorrow or the next day, we just go back to life as usual, and we don't do anything to help those who face these circumstances every day. People who are homeless, people who have never been able to rely on these needs. A lot of us, I think, are going to fall into that trap. I think that's what conforming to the world looks like. My problem is fixed, so I don't care anymore. But Paul calls us to be transformed by the renewing of our minds, and that's what the season of Lent is all about. Now, Lent is traditionally meant to be this interruption in our regular routine. That's why we give up something, we fast from something, or we take on a new spiritual practice. We do something to break up our regular routine. But I've been reflecting on this because it's the year of the pandemic. I mean, we're going on almost a year now. How do you break up a regular routine when our regular routine has already been disrupted for almost a year now? And I've been thinking about the things that, that drain energy from me and and add negativity to the world, things that are not good for my soul. Maybe something that we could do to interrupt our life is maybe we could interrupt the time and the energy we put into criticizing and complaining and ranting on social media. When I think about that, I think, is that making me a kinder person? Is that, is that making the world more loving? Is my two cents about the power grid and who I think should be to blame for this really doing anything to help the world? Am, am I going to care about this in a week? Is anybody going to care about it? Am I doing anything other than just trying to unload anger on somebody else? Maybe that's something that we can interrupt and give up for Lent is complaining and criticizing on social media. What if we saw that report of our screen time every week that comes in on Sunday, how many hours we spent per day on our phone? And what if we committed to spend just half of that in scripture and in prayer? Just half the time per day that we are on our screens or, or one-tenth of the time that we are on our screens to prayer and scripture during Lent? What if we interrupted our screen time a little bit during Lent? What if you joined Pastor Courtney's Lenten study and committed to being a part of that? Some of you have never joined a Bible study before. You've never been a part of that. Come and be a part of that. It's very easy. Walk through that story. Walk through that book with Pastor Courtney. Commit to that spiritual practice during Lent. What if we listened to Pastor Josh's wise words and didn't go back to the worst in humanity? But what if he stayed in the best of humanity for a little while? What if we looked around and saw our neighbors not as, as those people who, you know, their, their car is loud or their music is loud or they park in a place I don't like or, you know, they had that political sign I didn't like. What if we see them as neighbors like we did this week who are going through the same thing and we want nothing but the best for them? We see them across the street and we wave, hey, how's it going? Are you doing okay? Do you need anything? I'm here for you. I've seen more people say that online this week than probably ever before. Do you need anything? Here's where I am. I have power. I have water. What do you need? What can I help you with? That's what the kingdom of God looks like. That's what we're meant to be like. That's what being transformed is all about. Living in that new creation, not conforming to the patterns of the world by going back to drawing our lines and yelling at each other and having this unhealthy discourse on social media that consumes so much of many of our lives. Friends, many of us... We're not prepared for this crisis, physically, emotionally, or spiritually. 
But God is here for you. And I pray that we will spend the season of Lent trying to transform our minds. I hope that you will confess your sins. You're going to have a chance to do some of that confession and pardon and repentance here during this service, right after this video is over. The rest of the liturgy plays out through some time of prayer and confession, a chance for you to name those things, to take them to God and let them go so that they don't burden you any longer. They don't have to control you. God is here for you. I hope you'll do that. I hope you'll take this season, these 40 days, to repent to see yourself as a new creation made in the image of God, renewed by Christ's presence and hope. Friends, we will always have crisis and chaos. This isn't the last time that we'll go through something like this. But we don't always have to be unprepared, especially spiritually. We don't have to go back to being the worst of us. We can stay as examples of the best that humanity has to offer because the best that humanity has to offer is the image of God that we were made in. And I pray that you will take this season of Lent, beginning today on Ash Wednesday, to transform your mind, to renew your mind, to not conform to those patterns anymore, but to live and embody that image of Christ that each one of us bear so we can continue to be the best of humanity. That's our calling, and that's what the season of Lent is all about. Let us pray. Holy, amazing, and loving God, we thank you for being present with us this week as we've endured difficult times. Some of us still without power, without water, without heat. God, we pray for those who are living on the street. We pray for those who have to live day in and day out without the things that we lost this week. We had a taste of what it's like to not have that security and that comfort. And God, there are so many millions of people in the world who don't have those needs. May that break our heart. May this experience not just be something we look back and tell stories about, but something that changes our pattern of behavior as we go forward so that we might help rectify the injustices that we see in the world. God, open our eyes, humble our hearts, and help us to turn, to repent and turn toward you and use this season of Lent as a chance for renewal and transformation. God, we love you and we need you during this season. Be with us throughout these 40 days. In the name of Christ we pray.